Hello, and thank you for letting me be part of your conference with a smaller environmental footprint. My name is Sarah Cornell, and I'm a sustainability scientist at the Stockholm Resilience Centre, where most of our research is about exploring better ways to not wreck our planet. We live on a living planet, and of course, people have known this all around the world ever since the start of history. But part of my job as an Earth system scientist is to pull apart our understanding of how the Earth works into its components and their interactions. And a result of that is that somehow we've split people off from the rest of nature. And a result of that is that it makes it possible to see nature as just a resource to use. We don't see nature as part of our humanity or as the life support um, for our survival. Incidentally, I grew up about 150 kilometers away from this gold mine in Serra Pelada. That means I find it very hard to see any environmental issue as not a social issue at the same time. But today I want to focus on the environmental issues. People's activities are altering the whole planet, including its long-term geological processes. Geologists talk about this in terms of entering the Anthropocene, um, where the overall effect of our human activities is changing the way that the planet works. We've been working with the Planetary Boundaries Framework as a way of tracking this large-scale global change process. Um, each wedge in the framework represents a human-driven process where we're moving outside of the conditions, the stable climate and environmental conditions of the last 10,000 years or so. We're interested in climate change because when our climate changes, our environment becomes much less predictable. We're interested in the loss of biodiversity because when we destroy living nature and fail to support its regeneration, our environment is less resilient and it becomes more vulnerable to abrupt changes. When we chip away at land and water resources without thinking of their role as ecosystems, we multiply these pressures and vulnerabilities. We're changing the fundamental chemistry of life by altering the nutrient flows that support everything um, that we depend on. In other words, we're playing with food security and as we move to new energy sources, we're often risking pitting it against fuel security. And we know that we can make destructive substances that stay in the environment for a very long time. This means they can create harm in places far away from their sources. And that's why we bring everything together as part of the Planetary Boundaries Framework. Now, mining is just one of the ways that people have shaped the world and are shaping its geological pathway into the future. When I look at mining in terms of the Planetary Boundaries Framework, we see that it affects every one of the processes that we are already concerned about. And we know that we can do things differently. Um, about five years ago, the world's nations agreed on a shared agenda for sustainable development goals. And we've been doing some analysis on how it might be possible to achieve the 17 SDGs within the nine planetary boundaries of Earth's safe operating space. In this analysis, we started by looking at past trends, just in the recent past here, of the last 30 years or so. And we see that while the world has made some very important social gains, very often this has happened as a result of environmental losses at the global scale. We also modelled several scenarios, different possibilities for how the world might go into the future. We looked at business as usual, the same scenario. We looked at what might happen if we really focus on accelerating economic development faster. We thought about what it might mean to work harder on social, ecological and environmental objectives at the same time. And we explored some fundamental system changes. We call them smarter. And with smarter, you can see that we're getting closer um, to achieving the sustainable development goals and also 
remaining within a safe operating space. What does it take to do this? Well, we explored five big options that can play out across the whole world. Um, rapid decarbonisation of the global energy supply is important. We really need to reduce carbon emissions into the atmosphere as quickly as possible. And for some of us, that might mean taking things slower. We looked at food security and the shift towards much more sustainable use of the world's agricultural land, forests and oceans. We looked at new planning-based socio-economic development rather than just market-led development, especially looking at some of the positive experiences of poorer countries moving into more successful um, economies in the present day. We call for a really active redistribution of income. A big inequality contributes to instability in the world. Um, and this is an important priority for the SDGs. We're interested in inequality not just within countries, but within, between countries as well. And finally, we really want to emphasize that it takes a lot of collective work to have the means for stable societies in a context of global environmental change. So we focus on education, gender equality and health as well. That's our smarter pathway as we move into the future. So I want to just wrap up by coming back to where I started, our living planet. Um, today's environmental crisis in some ways isn't a proper crisis. We can't manage our way out of it as one big event and then bounce back to where we started. If we work within our living world, we need to really keep on working together with all of our energy and all of our creativity to build up our life support systems and not undermine them. So thank you so much for this opportunity to speak to you and best wishes for the rest of your conference.